<laughs> okay, will you will you say it again? Will you say it again? N- bula 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 basis. Bula basis. Bulu basis. Bulu basis. Yeah. So the O's are silent. No. Boo. It's just B U. Boo. No, it's also B O U. Oh. Well, I'm taking those out <laughs> for my own. <laughs> the O uh, is well-being. <laughs> I've never. <laughs> I can't think of a word where the O is. Silent. Well, your last name. <laughs> we'll start there. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Uh, how? Okay, so we actually pronounce it in Greek. Yeah, it's bulumbasis in Greek. How have other people butchered it in the way that I have? <laughs> well, everyone thinks bouillabaisse, yeah. especially because of the food writing yeah. career I had and... Which is ridiculous because I always tell people I'd spell it correctly if I was going going for that pen name. Um, and we're not French. People are like, are you Creole? <laughs> no. <laughs> I get that more often than you would think. What What other... So like for me growing up, people would say... it's Well, actually, people wouldn't mispronounce Laidlaw. But for whatever reason, I would always get mail or like maybe if I like called somebody and told them my last name, it would get lost in translation. So I would get stuff that say like laid low, uh, lud low. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's like very simple phonically. It's laid law. It's spelled laid law. Right. My dad always says it, you know, it looks like it sounds and people still are for whatever reason. I mean, that's what I think, but now I'm realizing there's a silent O. <laughs> um, you're the only laid law I know. I think it's maybe. A I'm literally the thing. only one, actually. My dad doesn't even have the same last name. Yeah, I just made it up when I was born. You're lying to me. <laughs> yeah, of course I'm lying. <laughs> I mean, stranger things have happened. I know tons of kids with made up last names. It's like sometimes they com- combo the names. <sighs> All right, well. We'll leave it at that. My name's real. Let's go. Victoria. The O is silent. <laughs> Bulu basis. So it's Victria. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. Let's go with that. I'm going to start that trend right now. Great. Love it. Everyone who doesn't know you for the first time, they're going to hear your name as Victria Bulu basis. Perfect. Welcome to the Buddy Ruski Show. <laughs> Uh, I am here with my dear friend, Victoria, uh, whose last name you have heard a number of times at this point. Uh, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. It's been a lot of years of <laughs> it's been being three. too shy. Exactly. Okay. It's been three years of I still have the notes up the from your first uh, <laughs> attempt. Uh, Victoria is uh, a multitude of things, DJ, writer, documentarian, uh, journalist, multimedia producer, uh, I could go on and on, uh, and you'll hear all about that uh, during the show. Uh, but to start, uh, as we start with everyone, I would love to hear a little bit about uh, where you're from and how we got here. So um, maybe start with uh, with your roots in the, in the Dirty Jurors, and uh, we'll move to uh, how you got to North Carolina and uh, involved in the journalism scene here. Yeah, the secret's out. I am from New Jersey, um, <laughs> North Jersey to be exact. My Is that contentious? Like if you, do you have to be specific about saying North Jersey? I wouldn't say it's contentious. Okay. It's just South Jersey is like a different world. Yeah. And like South Jersey people are closer to Philly and North is closer to New York. So there's like, there's a vibe. There are different vibes. Yeah. <laughs> I think no, nothing... Like, there's no rivalry that I know of, but I left too young. So, Um, yeah, I am very Greek American. I grew up in um, a family of restaurants in Jersey. It was diners. Um, My grandpa had a number of diners. Um, So, yeah, the Greek diner that, like, has a Greek menu, but also everything else. (laughs) Um, Pages and pages of food. And we moved down here when I was seven and a half um, because my dad knew other Greeks from his village um, who lived in Winston-Salem, and they had an opportunity for him to run a restaurant, which is nowhere near the coast, but it's fried seafood, so like popcorn shrimp and stuff. 
So I went from like disco fries to hush puppies. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it's interesting that there was a faction of Greek folks in Winston-Salem. I would have never, my, my uncle uh, and cousins, my uncle and aunt and cousins have lived in Winston-Salem or actually in Clemens uh, for most of my life, if not all of my life. Um, and so I've been there quite a few times and just, yeah, would never have thought that there was like a little pocket of, yeah. uh, of Greece in, in that part of North Carolina. Yeah, and to be clear, I am from Clemens, but I always say Winston because the Greek community is, is Winston, and that's where like the church and like I went to Greek school and learned all my Greekness. Um, yeah, it's super interesting actually. I feel like Winston and Charlotte have bigger communities than Raleigh even, but I have written about this before. For the News and Observer, I did a story about um, the Greek-owned restaurant history in Raleigh. Um, so like the Mecca, which is no longer Greek owned, but for a while it was the longest running same family owned restaurant in the state. And now that, um, award <laughs> or honor goes to Dick's hot dogs and in, in Wilson, um, which is still run by the same family, the Gliamaris family. Um, but yeah, I did this, this sort of deep dive and I learned that like the first Greeks came to North Carolina in 1897 the late 1890s, basically. Um, and that's where we got that uh, hot dog joint. Oh, no, I'm forgetting the name. It's across from Flex, the gay bar. And there's like a neon sign that says Flex, and the hot dog place has a neon sign that says Hot Wieners. So it can mm, be confusing. Like synergy. If, <laughs> where you're going. Ah, what is it called? We're going to have to edit this in. Okay, we'll find it. Um, anyway, yeah, so... There's just been different waves, just like any migration story from any country, as I'm learning now in my work with like different parts of Latin America, like waves of people come for political reasons. Um, and so, yeah, my my grandpa came during a civil war. He ended up in Greensboro before he, he went up to New Jersey. That's my mom's father. And then my dad came um, during a coup in the seventies. So yeah, there's just like these different waves and often as with any migrant history, when you're coming from a small town or village, um, one family knows another family. They, they tell everyone this is the place to be. There's jobs here and they just keep coming. So Winston-Salem, I would say the church there has about 400 families and, um, the majority are, are Greek. Um, and then we have like some like Arab Orthodox folks, Ethiopian Orthodox folks, and then like who we call converts who are just straight up Anglos who decided to convert. What was, so you said you moved here when you were seven from New Jersey. How much of New Jersey do you remember and, and how different uh, or how much of a transition was it coming from New Jersey to the South? Um, I think it was notable for me more because of like the way southern kids reacted to me specifically um new jersey was very diverse and like i remember you know growing up not even being in kindergarten yet and all of my friends on the block in the suburbs were um of a different culture or race their parents were mixed race um I had a friend, Darius, he was Indian Italian. Um, my best friend, Kareem, was El Salvadoran Egyptian. <laughs> um, you know, and then the schools were like very diverse, and it was not thrown in your face that there was a diversity there. It was just there and normalized. Um, so, and this is like very suburban New Jersey. Um, I wasn't like in the city or anything. And then coming to Clemens, I remember consciously in third grade realizing I was the only white girl with brown eyes mm. um, and it was also school started in August which you know it starts like after Labor Day in New Jersey so um, you know I'm coming in from the summer I'm like super tan and kids asked me what are you constantly um, and it was very device it was just like black and white there wasn't anything else I didn't have any Greek kids in that school with me um, and so, 
yeah, it was really strange. And like all the white girls asked me, what are you? So then I ended up hanging out with the black girls and I learned how to like double dutch <laughs> on the black top. And like um, they called me Blossom. I don't know if you've ever seen that show. <laughs> what show? Blossom with um, Maya Bialik and Joey Lawrence. But it was the show in the 90s and this girl with a big nose <laughs> was the star and she wore a hat. Um, and I used to wear hats like that with like flowers on them, like pinned on them. So I remember like double dutching. They'd be like, go Blossom, <laughs> go Blossom. <laughs> but it was really apparent to me that it was different um, and that I was somehow being singled out for not really being in between, but just like I had I had an accent. I said like dog and mall <laughs> and shit. <laughs> like this child talking like a Jersey girl. So yeah, um, I love Janet Jackson and Paula Abdul. And that just like wasn't cool with the white girls yet. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that to me, that's all I remember. It was very much like a socialization of understanding that that um and that I didn't realize I came from a different place but like getting asked like where are you from and what are you all the time made me think like okay that's weird <laughs> yeah did that carry through high school it did um I feel like my high school wasn't really diverse my sister's four years younger and five in grades and I feel like once she came up it um it was more diverse but I've always like attached myself to other like first generation Americans like myself. So we're like, I mean, my mother was born here to Greek parents and my dad was born in Greece. So I'm like first and a half, um, but like someone with similar backgrounds. So my best friend in high school was um, an Indian girl. Um, and we just could relate to like our weird, you know, parents being strict about the dumbest things that like our white friends I mean I'm white but our Anglo friends didn't have to deal with and um uh yeah so like I was all, I've always been drawn to like kids who had like who are bicultural I guess yeah it's interesting I, I remember us talking before we were recording and um you know you making that distinction between being white but still being othered in this way uh, you know, growing up here in, in North Carolina. And it's interesting. I think you're right. I mean, even here in Durham, you know, when I was in, in school, there were, uh, you know, the Hispanic population was growing, but it was still pretty small. So it was mostly like black kids, white kids. Um, and then even for me growing up in, in Watts Hillendale, um, you know, most of my friends growing up were white. So I remember going through similar things in school being, you know, light skin, mixed, people asking me. I guess like maybe once I got to high school and had like a little bit of awkward facial hair, it would make <laughs> it harder to figure out like if I was just black or if I was mixed and if I was mixed, what I was mixed with. And I had really long hair, so it was just um, super confusing. And then when I got to Winston-Salem State University, um, I was there for a semester right out of high school and I remember it being really jarring, uh, having grown up mostly around, you know, middle, upper class, white Jewish kids to then go to an all black school. And, you know, on the surface, no one can really tell the difference, but I definitely could feel like this is not, not my crowd or like, mm -hmm. this is not an environment that I'm used to being in, or even frankly, like comfortable in. Um, and yeah, so navigating all that when you're younger can be um, can be challenging, and I still think we haven't figured out a way to set children up for success in having these types of conversations about where people are from, different cultures, all that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure, but I think from observing my friends who have young children, like, I do think it's getting better, and I also feel like um, like in New Jersey, it was like I was saying, like there were mixed race, mixed culture families. Um, and so I don't remember having like, I remember there was like a lot of sharing, but not like, like differentiating, if that makes any sense. Um, 
but like very cognizant of like, oh, this is this comes from this person's particular culture. So not this like hippie bullshit, like we're all one, you know, um, like <laughs> very <laughs> don't choke on that coconut water. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, I think the South. And this is what I explore a lot in my work, like it's always been diverse, but people have been put in the shadows more. Um, and I think that's changing. And I've even noticed it, like, obviously, I walk around the world and don't experience racism. You know, like, that's not, like, that's the privilege I have. Um, but I do remember, like, even trying to, like, establish myself as a Southerner. I've been here since I was seven, and I'm almost 40. You know, like, it's taken so long for me to, like, adopt that for myself. And also, in the food world, um, a lot of the other food writers in my field are white women, and, like, I never really felt accepted by them as like a southern identity until very recently um and I think that's because like the way we talk about food is changing and there's like more voices um but yeah I, I think that like it's also hard and we're probably going to get into this based on <laughs> what I think you're going to ask me um to for people who don't grow up in those settings to understand that like the multi-layered human experience. So like, obviously I'm Greek, but like, there's so much more about me. And so like, I may present as like an anomaly, but like most of us are, most of us are like influenced by so many different parts of our lives and relationships and environments. Um, and so, yeah, I may not present like some of the super Greek people other people might know because of all these other things I do and enjoy. Um, and like, I, imagine that for you going to like Winston Salem State for the first time you're like oh wow like this is like very this and I maybe I don't feel comfortable yet but like I can explore that part of me here yeah absolutely and I think it's funny because I I didn't intentionally go to Winston Salem State because it's an HBCU and I only stayed there one semester and then I ended up going to Durham Tech for a couple years and then enrolled at North Carolina Central and finished my degree there uh, which is also in HBCU. Uh, and in some ways, I think because of my experience the first time at Winston-Salem State, going to Central, I was I was somewhat drawn to Central to try again, to like mm -hmm. try to re-understand myself uh, at a different time in my life through this lens of being, uh, you know, black or presenting black and... and um, you know, wanting to understand that part of my uh, culture, my upbringing. And so, yeah, it, it definitely, um, like you said, people are, are multifaceted. And every time that you have an experience, you're adding to that mix, uh, whatever it is. And so it becomes, I wouldn't say more challenging, but as you get older, it, it you have to sort of rethink how you're not how, how you want to explain or like how you want to describe who you are because um yeah it's it becomes less simple yeah and it's like again it's just normalized like we don't have to like throw up a diversity flyer and be like come to this school or whatever like I think it's just what I'm noticing based on like yeah, like the children being brought up within my own family now and like my friends, um, everyone's got a little bit of something going on and uh, it's that's just the way it is. And I think like the next generation will have a better sense of um, maybe less identity crises. <laughs> What is it that drew you to journalism and being a journalist? Um, you know, it sounds like obviously you have uh, had these different life experiences and it's made you consider, uh, you know, what it means to explore identity, uh, culture, race, all these things. Um, but what is it about journalism? Where did that passion come from? 
Yeah, I mean, I think on a base level, as a kid, I grew up writing. I loved writing and reading, and I grew up gossiping. <laughs> so, like, I always had to know what was going on, and my my mom and grandma used to always talk about how they'd be, like, talking at the kitchen table, and I would be a toddler, and I'd run up and be like, who, who? <laughs> like, I needed to know who they were talking about. Often they weren't but often they were. Um, and so I think that's part of it. Like there's like, I always had this curiosity about people um, and it's, you know, gossip is, is cultural, especially in like um, a, gr a Greek family of mostly women. Um, and so that was sort of like my like baseline, but I've always wanted to really understand like the full picture of how things worked um, and, like, get deep into that well of, like, where's everything starting? And then pan out and understand how it's affecting people and humans at the end of the day. Um, and there's always something behind the story you see in, like, traditional media. And I think that's why I got into food. Um, because food tells its own stories. Um, but growing up in restaurants, like, I always knew what was happening in the kitchen and like the diversity there and like, you know, my Greek grandma learning Spanish curse words and teaching <laughs> Greek ones to Roberto, our favorite, our favorite dishwasher. <laughs> he was the best. Um, but you know, like these the people became parts of our family uh, working side by side um, with, you know, my elders, I guess. And so it was, like, I always, like, learned about their lives, and, like, they would bring food and share with us, and we would, you know, share, like, off-menu stuff constantly, like, from our family's kitchens, and, um, yeah, and so, like, there's always more behind that, um, behind the food, so that's how I sort of felt like food journalism was a way that I could be my descriptive writer self, um, answer a lot of questions, and sort of, like, trick the reader into paying attention to things that are really important. Yeah, so food was this vessel for you to introduce other uh, ideas or other points of view. Is that being in the in the kitchens and the restaurants, is that also where you picked up Spanish? Because I know a lot of your work um, has been, uh, has involved folks mm -hmm. in the um, Hispanic community. Yeah. Um, my dad, actually, when he first came to New York as an immigrant, worked in kitchens and picked up Spanish a lot easier than English, I think. Um, and so when I was younger, he would teach me phrases. Uh, and then, you know, I took it in high school and just kind of like breezed through. Um, and I grew up learning Greek uh, in my home. And so I remember... I was actually hoping to place out of a language when I started college and I needed one more semester of credit when they like I took an assessment and I took this class that I really loved. Um, and we learned a lot about like we did a little bit of like film um, and it was like Spanish level four, you know, like it was a basic class, but there was like the professor. No. <laughs> I mean, Spanish four is not that basic. Um, well, the professor, like, brought in a lot of interesting, like, creative elements and, like, the types of books we were reading were, like, interesting. And it was challenging, but not too difficult. Like, there was an ease for me that I enjoyed while still finding challenges. Like, there, it, you know, it felt like a puzzle. Um, and I'm like, huh, I wonder if I could also major in this. So I ended up majoring in it as well as journalism. So then I, like, went into, like, super advanced classes and... Um, but that's how I learned, that's how I learned to speak. And then I also worked in, um, one of my college gigs was Cosmic Cantina on Franklin Street. And I was always the only, because my Spanish was like good enough when they would like put the schedule together, they would be like, oh, Victoria can handle speaking Spanish to the staff. So I was the only English speaker on shift every time I worked. Um, and you know, there was like me cash register, somebody doing like the end of the burritos and then like the people in the back 
small ass kitchen cooking. And so I learned a lot of Spanish <laughs> there. And I still run into some of those guys at the Durham one. My manager, Juan, is still there, and he's always like, <laughs> um, So, yeah, that's – and then I just ended up befriending a lot of people, like I said, from immigrant backgrounds. And because North Carolina has so many Latinos, like, a lot of my friends were um, initially, like, a lot of South American folks um, who were also studying. Um, and then we'd end up partying together and, like – yeah, I just started listening to music with Spanish. I went to Spain to study abroad and actually spoke Spanish there <laughs> and made friends who spoke Spanish. It does seem like the kind of thing I've been tr trying on and off forever to learn Japanese. And it does seem like the kind of thing where there's a tipping point in the language learning experience where once you feel comfortable enough, even just working your way through with broken, you know, Spanish, English, uh, and someone else can understand you, that it kind of opens you up to new opportunities to reinforce it. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 I mean, learning language, as people I'm sure know, it's really difficult if you don't immerse yourself yeah. in environments that, um, yeah, reinforce that language for you. Um, will you talk to me about the Titan Tattler? <laughs> the, uh, speaking of gossip, I, it sounds like it was a, uh, gossip column that you wrote in high school. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> so Clemens is a small little town. Um, and West Forsyth High School, the Titans, that's uh, my high school. So the Clemens Courier was a weekly paper. I think it was weekly every Thursday um, that came out of Clemens. And so they had this column called the Titan Tadler. And it was my first journalism job. You didn't start this column. They had it already, and yeah. you took up the mantle. Yeah, so I remember um, my friend Priya Prasad, who was a year ahead of me, wrote it before me, and then um, I wrote it, I want to say my junior and senior year. Um, do I remember what I ever said? No. I think I had to, like, cover sports sometimes, which... <laughs> not my thing. Um, but yeah, I think I would just like, I mean, they covered high school sports in the career, but, um, I don't, I don't even know what I did. So it, w it wasn't, <laughs> uh, it wasn't a gossip column. It was like, a. it could have been, I, okay. I don't remember. I mean, I feel like I would, yeah. I mean, there'd be like accomplishments that I would put in the paper that uh, normal, normally wouldn't get in there. Um, I would just kind of like poke around and see what was happening and just like file something every week about it and like probably in like cheesy metaphors. I have no, I should, I should dig one up. I would, yeah, that would be uh, <laughs> a little wonderful to, to, to share. I assumed uh, knowing the work you do now that they would just be like, uh, cr you know, incredible takedowns of, um, <laughs> what? you know, politicians and other powerful people in Forsyth County. Uh, so. I was not paying attention to that shit in high school. <laughs> um, so you went on to, to study journalism and Spanish at UNC. Yeah. Um, what being in the, in the J school there at UNC, what, um, you know, for folks that don't know, I mean, the J school at UNC is like pretty prolific in terms of the journalists that it, um, you know, churns out and, you know, uh, folks get jobs at NPR, the Times, like, you know, it's a really, really strong program. Um, what was that experience like? And was there something within that your time at the J school there that you um, that stood out to you, uh, either, you know, positively or negatively? So I think what's interesting is that I graduated in 2005, I took an extra semester, so I was supposed to graduate in 04. But um What's interesting is that we were on the cusp of media changing, really. Um, and so I think what was hard for me was that I wanted to take, I knew I was going to be a writer, but I knew I was not ever going to go that daily grind of like chasing breaking news. It's, I don't think I would excel in that at all. Um, I like to really dig deep. And so I was like then thinking magazine feature writer. Yeah. Um, and thankfully, there's like more opportunities, even though journalism is struggling still, there's more opportunities for like that type of work. What but were the outlets then that you were 
uh, inspired by or considering uh, in 2004, 2005 that were doing the kind of work that you wanted to do? I mean, Gourmet Magazine was like a premier food magazine and they would dig deep. I remember they did this beautiful then, I should look at it now, but they did the story on the um, changing demographic um, in Durham of Mexican and other Latino, I think, um, businesses and La Vaquitas featured. And I still have that issue. Um, it came out when I was in college and Gourmet is now defunct, but I have this issue still. Um, and now I know the guys at La Vaquita really well and I've done multiple stories with them and an oral history even. Um, and so, yeah, we talk about that a lot, about how like that really put them on the map. Um, Antonio and Fidel Martinez are the brothers that run that. Um, Gourmet, Savour was another food magazine. Um, I think Mother Jones was around. Um, and I'm actually publishing in Mother Jones for the first time soon, which is exciting. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of full circle. Um, the indie was like what I was reading. And obviously, I would not have a career without the indie. Um, I, I built my niche there for a decade. Um, but yeah, you know, there were other big glossies, like there was a magazine, I think out of the UK, called Colors, that had interesting features. Like I was always at Barnes and Noble in like the weird magazine section. And I remember all of them being thematic, like to design, culture, food. Um, but I'd read these stories. Later, it was Lucky Peach that I really loved. I'd read these stories that were about so much more than you know, the crux of what the magazine was about. But I also really was like into like, I wanted to learn how to take photos. So I remember you chose a track, tracked track. Um, and I was news ed, which means I was a writer. And so I tried for three consecutive semesters to take a photojournalism class and they wouldn't let me because it was like prioritized to the viscom folks. Um, I, I think that might ch be changing now. And we, we had one web-based class where we had to make our own um, HTML website using Dreamweaver. Oh, God. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm sorry. I made a 100 in that class. <laughs> That's how, like, easy breezy it was. And then I remember, like, becoming a person that, like, you know, is very Googleable. <laughs> Googleable, Google Googleable, yeah. Googleable, um, and my gross, shitty ass, like pink starred website was still on the UNC, and I had to go through so much to ask them to take it down. I was like, "Please take this down. I'm a professional now." And they finally did, but like, I had to like email like tons of different people because um, it was up like years later after graduating. <laughs> no one needs to see. UNC.edu slash Vicky B. Like, it's not. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I feel like there, it, what, there wasn't, like, a really good component of, like, multidisciplinary work in the J school. That seems to have, have changed now. Um, I've uh, co-instructed a class there. Um, and there's, like, a lot more. Like, we didn't learn about ethics as much as we should have. Um, but those are changing in journalism. The idea of objectivity is being turned on its head and like reevaluated. And if it's even a possibility to be objective, you know? Um, and so I'm able to like teach students differently in ways that I wish existed then. Um, and so I wouldn't say that was necessarily negative, but there was a huge learning curve based on like what's traditionally taught in journalism schools that is like, you know, the, the UNCJ school has its own scandal going on now, too, and it's, like, for that very reason. Um, so. Is there anything in particular that um, you, through your work, you know, over the years that you go back to is, like, oh, this was, like, a thing that I got out of J school that I, like, use every day or, like, I couldn't have done my work without having this knowledge or this experience? Um, I think the strict spelling and grammar rules, there's this mm -hmm. like very notorious test that you have to take to, to pass J school and many people fail it. Um, it's a spelling and grammar test. Um, 
that was something I always excelled at. And I think part of it has to do with like, I, I mean, I would, I would attribute it to like learning a language young and like mm -hmm. really understanding like the semantics of grammar and spelling and the, and also like different ways to do it aside from English. Um, but I still got like, I think I got like an 83 and I was pissed where everyone's like your first try, you got an 83. Um, but in the J school, if you misspelled a person's name wrong in an article, it was minus 50 points. So you'd automatically fail that assignment. Um, and it's easy to do that as a typo and like, especially, but then I think having my name also helps because I'm like, I, I became a stickler for things and like pretty, pretty much a perfectionist in that realm. And I think like the J school drilled that in me. Like there were like those skills, especially um, AP style, uh, stuff like that. Do you think that some of that has changed with stuff being web-based and just internet culture and internet language bleeding into the media ecosystem now where you're not just writing copy? You know, if you're, if you work in journalism or you work in multimedia, you're not just publishing stuff for print newspaper, but you're writing social media copy, you're writing you know, uh, YouTube description captions or whatever. There's just like all these places where you're putting content that are not necessarily up, uh, held to the same standards as traditional journalism. So does that like, does it bother you at all? Like when you see, uh, you know, the New York Times like write some funky Instagram caption and they've got, you know, it's got, it's full of emojis and it just, it's not what you... Uh, sort of grew up in the business on does that are you comfortable with that change have you adopted your uh, publishing style at all to that um I don't well I also think for me I don't like when people spell things incorrectly sure um seems like a good baseline to start at yeah um and I or like use improper grammar um but I'm I mean you're my friend so you know like texting with me it's not there's nothing really proper about it I, I thought for a second you were about to talk to me about my writing and <laughs> I was like oh shit <laughs> we no. might have to turn this off <laughs> I've not noticed any any glaring errors Justin <laughs> thank goodness no but things like that is really I mean you actually text in full sentences I will say whereas like I probably don't yeah I haven't figured out how to not do that I th uh, no I think you're like very um not curated, but you're like cognizant of like what you put out. Whereas I've like, I do that with my work, but in like a personal setting, I don't, but that's not what you asked me. <laughs> I mean, I think for me, like most media, I mean, I catch typos a lot in like the New York times or something and tweet it out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like most media does okay if not in like a kind of cheesy way, but like it doesn't bother me because like you're, we're supposed to represent something more professional. Um, and then like culture media does it in a way that works always. Um, and like I, you know, turn, I look to them if in case like I'm writing something where that could fly. Um, I don't like it when I see it in like very trivial example, but I'm really into astrology. And so like I'll, read an astrology meme and there's something off in it like grammatically and I get so pissed <laughs> off <laughs> or like even some of these like psychologists who have like Instagram accounts and they have like really beautiful things to say that are really insightful but they like fuck up their or your I'm like, just like oh my god like get an editor <laughs> like I'm always screaming get an editor yeah um so that bothers me a lot and I wonder if that's part of it is that most, well not most, but a lot of media now is either self-published or it's like a collection of people all publishing but not necessarily editing one another or there's not a lead editor. Um, and so, yeah, you can just put whatever you want out into the world and there aren't these uh, – stop gaps, you know, along the way to prevent some of those mistakes like you would have in a traditional news environment. Yeah. And I also like think we should, I mean, I think it's, it's one thing to use vernacular 
which is totally awesome. Um, and it's another thing to like spell something wrong and not care. So I think there needs to be like a clear line there. And um, it, 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 bo- <laughs> it bothers me. Yeah. I wonder, um, I would be interested because specifically being in the South, maybe it's not specific to the South, but I've only ever lived here. So I think a, a lot about Southern vernacular and the way that uh, contractions are used and just different, um, a totally different style of speaking and whether or not those things should be allowed in writing because it, the people who are reading it, it would speak to them more than if they were reading the New York Times. Um, and there's, it comes up a lot during election cycles where, you know, people mention how, um, you know, the coasts essentially completely ignore the quote unquote flyover states. And, um, and the South, while there are a lot of Southern states on the coast, I feel like the South is kind of its own thing in, in these distinctions. It's not part of the East coast in the same way. Um, and so, yeah, I wonder what you think about, um, where, where to draw the line between putting your own, uh, or speaking to your audience, I guess, and being tr- traditionally correct. I mean, I think it depends on the outlet. Mm. Um, because, you know, there's this old adage, like, know your audience. And so I think, I think it depends. I personally really like when writers have a style um, and they may be doing like a reported piece with an angle that's more opinionated, but like there's a style there. Um, And it's interesting because you can talk about writers as like essayists and novelists and think of like, you know, the Southern prose there, like Zora Neale Hurston and others, you know, legends at this point who have sort of brought that into the fold um, and it's like either like a Southern way of writing, a Southern black way of writing. Um, and then there's other people who just do a really good job of like intellectualizing more like, you know, common parlance and like, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking of ta Coates a lot, but I'm not sure if can't can think of an example um because he writes so beautifully but also very clearly and like I think often throws in a few more like words that like you would say to your friend you know yeah um, I think he is a good example of that and I I um you know for the longest time have uh read stuff from what used to be Grantland what is now Bill Simmons project The Ringer um and uh folks like uh Shea Serrano who or Jason Concepcion have a very distinct style of writing uh, that also follows that same um, track of being clear, but also very much their style and adhering to traditional norms, but then breaking them in really mm. fun or interesting ways uh, to reinforce that unique style that they're trying to present um so yeah it is i think you're right like outlet matters i mean the, the ringer is pretty casual um and even coates writing you know depending on whether he's writing a book or publishing for the atlantic exactly. uh you know makes a big difference to that so yeah i think that's a, a great way to think about it and like i mean not to like segue or anything but it's also interesting because i don't often get that opportunity like I still have to write for like a wide variety of audiences. And in the past two years, I've been dual publishing in English and Spanish. Um, so my work gets translated into Spanish and then I get it from the translator. And sometimes, cause the translator is like a native Spanish speaker who now lives in New York. And so I've had to change some of the stuff she's translated into something that I know the Southerners who speak Spanish here (laughs) will understand better. Um, 
based on the way I wrote it in English, you know? So, yeah, it's it's really challenging, but it's kind of beautiful. I mean, playing with language is always so beautiful. What's up, everyone? Popping in to say that if you haven't already, subscribe to the Buddy Ruski newsletter. Not only will you get alerted when new episodes drop, but you'll stay up to date on all things Buddy Ruski, including new content on the blog, upcoming projects, and more. You can subscribe at BuddyRuski.com. Also, if you have feedback about the show or anything else you'd like to share, stories you're interested in, or people you think I should interview, my inbox is open. You can email me at Justin at BuddyRuski.com. All right, back to the episode. So coming out of the J school, when did you get your first writing opportunity with the indie? You mentioned the indie being a huge part of your career arc. Uh, you started out as a contributor there and then eventually made your way to food editor at the indie. Um, the indie, I don't know when they got a website, but they I still think of them as being sort of traditional newspaper journalism. Um, so, you know, that has changed somewhat over time. But, um, yeah, talk a little bit about sort of making your way uh, to the indie as a contributor. And, you know, and I know you were there for, for about a decade, so we can try to condense that, uh, <laughs> that chapter a little bit. But, um, yeah, speak to that experience. Yeah, I mean, I think I remember – so coming out of um, – college. I did not find a journalism job. Um, I worked very briefly for a few months. I did a temp job interpreting at um, a clinic for Wake County Human Services. Uh, and it was the vaccination clinic and the STD clinic. Mm. So uh, most of it was just like intake at the reception desk. But then I also had to like deliver bad news to patients in Spanish. Um about their SCD status. Um, and then I worked at Eurosportsoccer.com as a copywriter, and I was doing Spanish there as well. I didn't realize you'd work there. Yeah, that's why I know everyone there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I worked there for three years. Um, that was that was fun, really fun. Um, also hilarious that I was writing their Spanish catalog, if you think about it. But I did it. <laughs> a job is a job. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think I did a good job. Anyway, so, uh, I remember then while I was at Eurosport, you know, I'm like a year or two out of college. I like mailed a resume and clips to the indie. <laughs> like, here's my portfolio. And like, I think I emailed them a few times and like never got a response. You didn't send them the UNC at Vicky B, uh, <laughs> web link? I might have. I might have at that point. It's like the only portfolio online that I had. Um, gosh. I, I I can see it. It's so... You like scrolled over a star to like get to each category and it would like flip and show you the name of the section. Oh, God. It was so bad. I'm, I'm almost certain that's why the indie hired you. <laughs> it was like pink and black. Like that was like... It was like the color of your shirt. And black. Hardcore. Anyway, um, so I, a friend of mine, Matt Saldana, who's like one of my BFFs from college, um, ended up being a roommate after college for a bit. He was a reporter there and he put in a good word. So Jennifer Strom was the editor at the time and she met with me for lunch in Hillsboro because that's, I like took my lunch break <laughs> from my Hillsboro office to meet with her. And my first idea didn't pan out. Um, there was a lady from Peru cooking out of her home, um, and she would have these really awesome meals at her dining room table, and her kids would like serve you in between playing video games. Um, but that's where I learned that like that sort of thing was it didn't fly with the health department. <laughs> um, and so I I pitched that, and Jen was like super interested, and then it didn't work. So she's like, okay, I'm gonna sign you to this barbecue festival. <laughs> what the fuck am I going to write about? <laughs> um, but it was fun. It was like a fun like afternoon. And I wrote about that. And then I just like went in and like, they kind of let me do whatever I wanted to do. Um, and then under Lisa Sorg, I got really into writing about farm workers because I met this group of kids who were working in the fields. 
Um, and just like, I mean, they are, they were in high school and some of them still work in that nonprofit sector as like late twenties, early thirties. Um, and I still work with them. Like they're still my sources. So I got into that. It was the first time I visited farm worker labor camps and I realized like, why aren't we talking about this? And then I realized not enough journalists or any that I knew of at the time spoke Spanish. So I was able to like get into these worlds and have access that, like I said, like 10 plus years on, like these are still the communities that like trust me, can vouch for me when I want to meet more people. And like, that's my niche, you know? Yeah. It really helps to have those, uh, specific skills in particularly in media, um, that open doors for communities, but then also kind of give you, allow you to stand out in the media world when you're trying to get jobs. And, um, I, w I would love to hear a little bit more about the sort of how that evolved uh, over time writing stories, as we mentioned before, where food is this entry point, but it's not necessarily the, um, you know, the main takeaway from the story. Um, particularly, I mean, in Durham, in the last decade plus, I can't tell you how many times we've been in some magazine article that's like Durham, best food place, Durham, you know, top rated restaurants, we've got James Beard award winning chefs here. Um, you know, it's it's a very culturally rich uh, food destination, but uh, there are these other pieces to that puzzle uh, that are not as well understood and are not as glamorous. Mm -hmm. uh, and so was there tension there as you were both trying to cover, you know, restaurateurs that I'm sure you, um, whose food you appreciated and who you whose company you enjoyed and whose, whose work you liked um, while also understanding that like I should try to prioritize some of these other stories as well uh, so that people get the full picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I feel like when I was contributing, um, you know, Lisa Sorg especially was really excited um, to get my pitches and, would publish most of what I would like pitch. Um, she has a similar uh, taste for that sort of work. A hundred percent. Yeah, she really does. Um, but I do think when the indie became really focused on like web clicks that like the more expected type of food media was what they wanted. Um, and so I feel like the tensions arose more so. I mean, I I liked doing the restaurant stuff too. Um, and I would always, I never would want anyone to call me a food or restaurant critic. Um, because I, even when we would do reviews, we actually never had a rating system at the Indy. Um, and I think, you know, we would like go in and review a restaurant. But uh, I tried to just like, keep it about the experience um, and not say if something like focus on like more of the positive. Um, I do think there's so much room for restaurant criticism. I do think locally it's been a hard avenue. Um, I don't think people want to be critiqued. And I, I also totally understand how hard it is as a business owner to like get a bad review. I don't think we need to be making bad reviews, but I do think there should be like conversations around restaurant criticism and what that could look like. That's never something I ever wanted to do though. Um, so that's why when I was food editor, I hired a restaurant critic uh, or a restaurant reviewer specifically for that. Um, but there was tension of like, oh, we need to do this listicle or this like best places. And I, I always refuse to say best or top. Like I think there's like no way you can create a hierarchy <laughs> or and like, based on what criteria and like, who am I to say, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, I would say like our favorites. Um, but one thing I would try to do, so like we had to do these dish issues that were like food issues and I was in charge of them, food themed issues. So um, I remember I was like, let's do one on soup 
and I had to really convince the editor that it made sense. But I found these really cool stories. So um, a woman named Kim Long Grout wrote about pho, but like talked about like her um, family's immigration experience from Vietnam. And like, I mean, she's a beautiful writer, so it's like very poetic. Um, I found this uh, park of mobile homes where most people were from um, Cheran, which is an indigenous part of the state of Michoacan, Mexico. And it's actually um, an autonomous state. Um, so they have their own like government and they still speak much of the indigenous language. Um, and there's this, you know, mobile home park of people in Durham all from this place. And they also have adopted Catholicism. So there's, um, gosh, I don't even remember the saint, but there's like a saint's f feast day where this woman, like someone's like, this woman makes pozole for like hundreds of people. So um, I remember Alex Boner came with me to shoot the photographs and it was just this like beautiful celebration outdoors where like between the trailer homes, people had like string lights and then there was like a priest there and he did a ceremony and then they had these like, wooden like makeshift trays that men two men had to carry of just like bowls styrofoam bowls of pozole and I mean I don't know each tray had like 20 bowls on there and Alex took these beautiful photos of just like men carrying pozole like it was a procession and it was like honoring this dish because they were like honoring the saint and then I went into the history of like you know why pozole has pork in it because like it was an Aztec dish and then like the Spanish colonizers came and introduced pork and like this it's like the colonization of food is so interesting because it creates these like new cultural traditions um but then I got to talk to families about like why it's important for them what the pozole means to them and what this feast day means to them you know so it's like obviously more than soup um I don't know what question you asked me if that answers it, but basically that's literally how I would like be like, oh, you want to do a foodie issue? This is how we're going to do it. But then we also had like, um, I asked different writers and I would also like ask friends weird things. So like, like I asked Forge, Jordan Chavez, a DJ, but he's a, such a little foodie. And I'm like, Forge, do you have a favorite soup? Um, and he's like, yeah, I always get this one. I'm like, write a little blurb about it. And then I asked my friend Susie, um, Zade Locklear, who works at Coco Cinnamon, who I cook with a lot. I'm like, do you have a favorite soup? So I would just, I tried to get voices that were not the typical food writers. Um, and then Steve Oliva illustrated everyone's favorite soup. Uh, so we like, we had like this map of like the best, our favorite soups and like, they were all like multicultural and like the drawings were hilarious and yeah. But <laughs> that, I mean, I can't imagine that restaurant, any, everyone involved in the food community here wouldn't see that as a, as a positive way to um, showcase the, cult, the food culture that we have here mm -hmm. um, because it, it is much more than food. And I think it speaks to what I imagine Durham wanting to present as its values is that um, it's not a just it's not just about eating, but it's about building community. It's about understanding history. It's about um, you know communing with other people and other cultures. Um, so it I'm uh, grateful that the powers that be the indie sort of allowed you to really push that agenda because I think that it it does speak to um, you know Durham in in a really real way. Yeah, and I think too like we did focus on restaurants like um, that whole little soup spread was like where you can get your favorite soups. I insisted on putting um, Ricky from Saltbox, Ricky Moore, his clam chow or his chowder on the cover, which we did. And I remember like having like argumentative discussions about it in the office and people were like, he's a seafood spot. Why would we feature that? And then I'm like, that's why. Like he is also like a trained chef who he utilizes seafood in beautiful ways. And like, I, I I think like it'd be cool to see, like people think of soup as dainty, but to see like hands dunking bread into this chowder on the cover, like makes sense to me. And 
we did it, you know, like, and that was a way to like showcase more of Ricky, you know. And then he won the James Beard Award. So I'm well, assuming he has you to thank for that. <laughs> no, but <laughs> I love that guy. Um, so you you spend roughly a decade at the Indy. Um, and during your time there, you actually end up going back to school to get a master's degree. What was there something that you were seeing through your work? Um, the degree is in American studies. Um, was there something that you felt like you needed to reinforce in your journalism that pushed you to going back to school? I was hoping, you know, I had just started film at that time, so I was hoping to explore more of that, um, which I sort of did. Um, but really, I was kind of looking for time. Uh, I feel like when you go back to grad school, especially as an adult, I was already in my 30s, mid 30s, you're very focused on like, for at least I was, like there's a luxury of time it provides. You can sort of stop everything else you were doing. I was still working um, and also TAing, but uh, I had time to really think about like these ideas that had always been brewing without being pushed against a deadline. Well, a weekly deadline. And um, I wanted to go to Mexico and meet the families of like a lot of the cooks I had met. Um, especially in the Chapel Hill Carbro scene, they're all from or many of them are from this one place in Mexico, Celaya, Guanajuato. And so, and they were always talking about their families and like doing it for their families um, that they hadn't seen in, you know, 20 years, many of them. Um, and so that's what I did. And I ended up coming up with, you know, a thesis, but also like a few stories that were published. Um, and it was really challenging work for everyone involved not just me, um, a lot of emotions, um, a lot of like, s since, you know, it's been years since I went, but like a lot of better progress and good news and like families being able to visit each other now, but then they weren't. Um, and so, yeah, I went to Celaya at least three times um, and just like explored the stories and like gained a better sense and like, it was a very humbling experience to understand like as close as I could um, what those experiences of migration felt like. You mentioned getting a little bit into video. Was that something that you were called to? Was that just where you saw the industry going? A little bit of both. Um, this was, uh, I guess, around 2016. Um, so, you know, vi video in particular, I feel like people were really gravitating. I just, I know like tons of stories um, around media outlets specifically popping up around video yeah. um, and social media algorithms changing to really prioritize video and media companies gravitating towards that. Um, but yeah, was that just like an evolution of your or your work or were you seeing that also as like, this might be the path forward in journalism as an industry. Yeah, I think it was both. Um, it was actually 2014 for me. Um, and I have always worked closely with the visual folks. So like DL Anderson and Jeremy Lang were the two photographers I worked most closely with at the Indy through my time. Um, and DL and I wanted to do video at the Indy. <laughs> and we had all these ideas um, and that eventually morphed into Vittles Films. Um, and Derek DL has done a ton of work there. Um, and my first film, it's called Un Buen Carnicero, A Good Butcher. It's about Cliff's Meat Market. Um, that came out of Vittles. And then Tolo, who's the main character in that film, is from Celaya. So like I went and visited his family and like stayed with his sister and met his mom and dad and... Um, I still have some, I have some video footage of that that I'm always trying to like create a longer film with, but it's pretty amateur. <laughs> a vignette then. Yeah. Starting your work in video, was there a particular skill or something, a, a way of storytelling 
that you were able to do in that space that you maybe weren't able to do with your writing? I mean, I will say it was a huge learning curve um, because you really need to get people to say things. Um, there's no like, uh, you know, you can't write in the nuance. But I also learned you can show it if they don't say something super directly. So I do think that my first film was pretty nuanced. Um, many of that done on purpose. But um, yeah, I mean, visually and sonically, I think sound has really been interesting to me. Um, what you can really express that way and the feelings and emotions that are evoked through hearing something and like pacing and placing things in a certain way. I, I really appreciated that. Also like working with musicians to do like an original score. Ari Picker did that score for us. Um, and then there's like a cumbia song because the guys keep listening. They would listen to all this stuff at the butcher shop on their phones. And like there was a cumbia song that we really liked. And there's actually like a pig noise in it, <laughs> like a pig squeal. So I just like emailed that band. It's like a super famous band. I um, can't remember the name in Mexico. And I was just like, you know, I had like a lawyer, an immigration lawyer, like look over my Spanish. I'm like, does this sound okay? Like legally. And then they were just like, si, sí, está bien, gracias. <laughs> like <laughs> they didn't charge us and they were just like so cool with it. Um, so, but like, yeah, bringing the richness of sound, um, I really love like taking time with visuals and just like the experiential components of like sitting in one spot. And what was really fun about that movie was that we shot it in a day and it was like, it's the busiest day in the shop. It's July 3rd. So like right before 4th of July, people were coming in and get their meat for cookouts and stuff. And there was so much tension and we could like show that by like, you know, photographing things really tight. Um, or like the monotonous, like him cutting up the chicken or stacking the bacon or like all these like things while he's saying something really profound, you know, combining the words to the visuals. Like I, I love that experience. It's not something you can do in a, in a written piece. Yeah. And to your point about having to get people to say things, no matter like sort of who it is, asking someone asking someone a question and then writing it down versus having them say it on camera. Like you could ask them the same question and they're going to give you maybe not a different answer, but like the way it's conveyed is going to look and feel different. Um, and to your point, like trying to, uh, to convey those nuances in a written piece uh, and, and showing that emotion, which, so, you know, some writers do very well, um, but it is nice to, see it visually and to have the body language uh, on screen or to have other visuals uh, that speak to whatever, um, you know, is being said by the person narrating at the time. So, yeah, I have also been thinking a lot about sort of how video and documentary, um, yeah, just, just adds another layer. It's not that it's um, better than the written word, uh, but it's a different way of storytelling, and particularly when it's uh, things that involve stuff like music or or sound. If you're in a restaurant or you know covering a band or anything like that, it's nice to be able to have those components. Yeah, it's a way more immersive way, um, an easier way to drop people into a scene, um, but it's difficult to do it well. Uh, and so, yeah. I learned so much that first film, especially, and like being with DL in the edit room till very late at night, um, watching how he was editing and then like, you know, giving my feedback uh, and just like working very closely. Like it was, yeah, I mean, I love it. I love making films. What is the, the story or what is the thing when you're working on a, either a piece or, or a video or even a podcast, which you've done as well. Um, what is the thing that you most want to convey when producing something? Is there an underlining theme in your work that you're hoping that each piece kind of has where you feel like your stamp is on it? That's a great question. I mean, I think I just want 
the voices that are the main part of the story and often affected by like systemic injustices because it's always where my stories come to. I want that to carry the story and I also want them to be their lives to feel celebrated within the story. So again, because of the nature of my work, there's always like some shit going down <laughs> that's ruining someone's life. Um, but that's not like the focus. Like it's, it's the undercurrent, but I want, you know, I try to capture a lot of laughter. Um, I want it to feel natural. I ask people to like accompany them to like normal everyday things. Um, family stuff comes up a lot because that's where like they're there they're themselves. Um, and so I want to convey the like, um, the essence of somebody's character and honor and celebrate that as much as possible, no matter how like hard the story could be. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And I think that it, um, you know, it does really help sort of root people in, um, community and the human experience to know that people are, um, just like people are multicultural. They're also, um, you know, their emotional spectrum is wide ranging and folks can be feeling multiple things at once. They can be sad for a situation that they're, that they're dealing with, but be happy in a particular moment, you know, being with family or, um, you know, being at their place of business where they feel at home. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's nice to have that, um, reminder in mm -hmm. a story to know that even if the theme is, um, you know, something like COVID or, uh, you know, other things that folks have dealt with the last couple of years that, um, there are still opportunities to shine a bit of light and, um, and up, uplift these stories and in, in people's lives so that they, yeah. Um, so it's not so doom and gloom. I feel like we have enough of that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, world. you often like, whether it's a celebrity chef or another celebrity, like how many stories have you read where y the lead starts and they're like, so-and-so walked into the room in their Bob haircut, wearing this lipstick poised, like blah, blah, blah. It's just like, it's just like all these like, like praise from the start about this like person that we're supposed to like care about. And I feel like immigrants in stories are not treated that way most of the time. Um, and I say immigrants because it's like my work's about that, uh, that community. But, you know, and so I, I want to give them the same type of treatment and like normalize the playing field of like how these identities are expressed in media and presented, but in a much more real, less cheesy way, <laughs> you know. So when you're not on the road, uh, reporting stories, making documentaries, uh, covering all the wonderful things that we've talked about on the show thus far, you moonlight as a DJ as part of the group Mommies and Poppies. Uh, how did you, uh, music has been, um, you know, sort of a big part of your life, uh, but how did you, or when did you decide to kind of turn it into a a passion project of sorts? Um, well, yeah, just to be clear, I don't play music. <laughs> I mean, I don't oh. play instruments. Okay. So music's a part of my life just because, like, my my parents always played it and different things from, like, Greek folk to... To you know, Janet Jackson and to, Paul Abdul. Yeah, well, that was, that was me. Um, but, like, to Motown or, like, my mom liked Selena a lot, you know? Um... So, yeah, I learned all that stuff. Um, but Arelli, my friend Arelli, basically said, you're going to DJ. <laughs> and she said it to a few of us, and we're like, okay. So she just made us learn. <laughs> and, yeah, it's great. So this is Arelli uh, from Little Waves and Coco Cinnamon, who uh, 
yeah, has also, I, w- w- I guess she was DJing some before Mommies and Poppies because I think we had her DJ a few runaway parties back in the day. Um, yeah, she was um, a radio DJ in college at UNC. That's where I met her actually many years ago. And, um, and then she like got into DJing, DJing. And so she came to you and, and a couple other folks uh, one day and just said like, hey, I want to put together a crew and I don't know anybody else. So I'm going to turn you all into DJs. How, how did that conversation? She, she Who else is in the people. group she as just well? Chose. <laughs> we were the well, chosen sure. ones. Um, yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't remember the conversation. Like Aureli's a woman of few words as well. So <laughs> it just kind of happened. Um, but you know, as my friend, I trusted her. I've done wilder things that she's asked me to do. So who else um, is in the group? So right now it's, um, Aurelia's bird girl. I'm Uimami. Michelle is bacon butter and Steph is Maduro. What do you enjoy most about, uh, about playing music or, or being a DJ versus just like making playlists or sort of experiencing music through the ways that you have thus far? Um, you know, I started off being really a perfectionist about it and like planning my sets, but, and I'm not, I don't feel like I'm a natural performer. Like it's not something I'm craving for people to like watch me do something. (laughs) Like, um, I, I don't like attention like that. Uh, but I've really enjoyed sort of like the improv of it. And a lot of that has to do with like vibing off the crowd. Um, so we had a party last week at PS 37 and raised over a thousand dollars for Carolina abortion fund. And it was a Thursday night. So I wasn't sure. And it was an early, we said eight to 12 and people did come later because we figured, but yo, like everyone was ready. And I think that's what was awesome about it was, um, it was so easy and fun to be like, okay, I know exactly what these people want to hear. Um, and in the beginning, we had like a, a more Latin crowd. And so we were playing, Rally and I did this party together. And we like switched off um, and each did like an hour, an hour, an hour, an hour. And in the beginning, I'm like, oh my God, they're going to vibe to this Bad Bunny song and sing it. But then I can like mix it with like a 90s that I get done. They're also going to sing that. Like I could tell what kind of people we had going on. Um, and then later, um, you know, we got more into like, I really did this like amazing cumbia set and people were just like getting in their little circles and clapping for each other and like rooting each other on and like dancing, like just ecstatically. Um, and then I went into like house and disco and everyone was like losing their minds because everyone was just there to let go. Like we've had such a hard time societally. Um, and that's the kind of parties that we want to play. And that's what we were hoping would happen. We just didn't expect on a Thursday to like get that. I mean, a lot of a lot of people wrote me and they're like, I've been so introverted lately. I'm just going to come see you, but I'm going to leave early. And they were there till past 12, you know, like they just stayed. One one person told me she wasn't going to come out because she wanted to go to the party the next day and like her capacity for the public. And then she was there and she's like, I'm so glad I came. Um, so to me, it's about like vibing with the crowd and just it's a shared experience of movement and release and like being yourself on the dance floor and you saw this like collective wave of like people bobbing their heads and shaking their their bodies to this music um and that's what I want to see and I really love when people are making out to my sets like you catch (laughs) you catch little pockets of like people getting a little tongue-tied and you're like oh I love you thank you (laughs) I will say that's a highlight (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, the the parties always have this gravitational pull to the dance floor and to the energy. And I've never really been to a Mommies and Poppies show where there are where there's the dance floor and the people adjacent to the dance floor who are kind of just lingering. It's always like if you were on the dance floor, you are very present on the dance floor. Oh, I um, love it. <laughs> and we talked a little bit about this um, last week around like the culture around dance and how, um, you know, different um, 
or different groups of people, dance is is not just this like way to potentially move to hooking up with someone, although it sounds like that <laughs> can be a thing that also makes uh, Victoria, you know, excited for the parties involved. Um, <laughs> but that it is like, it, it, it truly is another just way of expressing yourself. Um, and so creating an environment, a music musical environment uh, where people feel really comfortable doing that. I mean, I, I think even, you know, the, the mommies and poppy shows get people to dance who aren't normally that comfortable being that expressive on the dance floor. I, I can really? speak from experience, both myself and talking to other people. I just think that that is the, um, yeah, the atmosphere that is there. I think that you all create that as DJs and also just the crowd knows that's the vibe when they show up. Um, and so it's a, it's a very like nurturing atmosphere in that way. Um, that feels so nice to hear. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, I think it's, <laughs> so I think it's real. I, I, I'm not saying that. Um, you I know, didn't realize that was a little discussion <laughs> happening. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's important. I think that, um, you know, folks need spaces to release, um, to express themselves, to feel comfortable doing so, um, and to learn something. I, I definitely am the kind of person who goes to shows regardless if it's like a show or a dance party or whatever and is just shazamming music all <laughs> night long <laughs> yeah. uh and so I, I really you know enjoy that aspect of it not just being a fun place to hang out and dance but to yeah learn some new reggaeton songs or um you know bad bunny drops or whatever um i tried to channel my inner bad bunny today I with my outfit it. uh just for you um but yeah, it is. It's it's a great, um, yeah, great part of the Durham nightlife scene, DJ scene, and um, I'm excited for you all to to keep doing that. And um, you know, for it, it sounds like it's been a great experience for you as well. It's like a different thing to kind of pour into artistically. Um, so I will will definitely uh, you know drop all the necessary links for mommies and poppies in the in Thanks. the show notes and everything and, and hope folks can make the next show, which is when right now we are definitely, I mean, we haven't signed the contract yet, but we should be playing at the North Carolina museum of art on September 18th, which is a Sunday day party outside in the amphitheater. Um, Steph and I did it together last year and it was a ton of fun. Um, and the, all four of us are going to be there this year that's amazing yeah i mean it's still kind of hot in september but it'll be a little bit cooler a day party i'm always game yeah. for a good day Bring party your snacks and your hydration and your blankets and is there anything booty. in particular that you are uh like experimenting with now musically that you might uh drop at that party um that will likely be they well i don't know actually last time we did sort of like the history of Latinx music. So we just did a bunch of interesting stuff from like older ballads to like, you know, trippy cumbias um, and then like reggaeton and salsa merengue. Um, Steph throws in bachata. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do. Um, I, on a personal level, have been listening to like more... I, I love funky elements and disco elements. Um, and I'm really into like Turkish, Armenian disco house from like the 70s to present, um, that sort of thing. I'm always trying to drop some Middle Eastern stuff. I finally found some good new Greek music, um, but it's a lot, it's a little bit more on the indie side. Um, but if I can find a good bouzouki beat, I'll throw it in <laughs> if it makes sense. Um, and then, like, I've found a DJ that I like who does really good Bad Bunny remixes. So I've been buying a lot of his stuff. Um, yeah, you know, I'm always going to be talking about my Benito. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I have not uh, made the leap into DJing yet, but even just uh, making... I've been more um, 
interested in like these curated playlists that I've been making and I'm really loving trying them to. Too. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, not just like throw songs together that kind of sound, you know, similar and just like hit shuffle, but actually like make, you know, a a playlist um, like I used to do when I was like burning through uh, blank CDs in middle and high school. Um, and so there's something. The, the part the like music discovery aspect of that I really enjoy and it sounds like you do as well where you kind of forced to like really dig into the sounds that you're looking for or the like particular region of music that you're called to at a certain time uh I, I yeah the it, it's it feels tied to that journalistic instinct of discovery and wanting to understand really like not just the music, but like more about the artist and why they make the choices they do and what their influences are. And, you know, for me in hip hop, like sampling is a huge thing. I love going through, uh, you know, the sample choices of producers and understanding, um, you know, what they are and how they relate to the, you know, the music currently. So I think, yeah, that there is a, it doesn't surprise me um, that you have made this, um, Made, you know, made the jump into DJing because it, it feels uh, similar or feels in the same uh, vein as the, the work you do as a, as a journalist. Well, thank you so much for uh, being on the show and uh, spending what is now an hour and a half uh, of great <laughs> conversation nice. and learning more about your work. You've been I think uh, a mainstay in the media ecosystem in North Carolina for as long as I can remember. Um, and I've always enjoyed the work you've done. So uh, it's, it's really been uh, an honor to, to have you on the show and um, look forward to, to all the other things that you have going on. Thank you, Justin. I appreciate this and I appreciate you. Where should people uh, look for your work or find you? What's the best place for people to follow your stuff? Um, I'm on Twitter at this feeds me. It's the best place I think. Great. Um, is there a this feeds me.com? There used to be, there's a Victoria Okay. Um, and all of my favorite work is on there. Awesome. Um, yeah, I, I imagine there probably aren't any pink stars and, um, <laughs> you know, graphic. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, thank you again for, for being on the show. Uh, this has been episode 28 of the Buddy Ruski show. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, for me, you can find me everywhere uh, at Buddy Ruski, uh, buddyruski.com. You can subscribe to the newsletter there. I always put the show out through the newsletter. So um, regardless of what your streaming service of choice is, uh, you can always find it through that. So that would be the, the thing to do would be to sign up for the newsletter. Um, if you really want to, you can come bug me on social media. I've really tried to trim back my social media usage. Um, so sending people to the, the website and the newsletter, but I always love if folks want to reach out and talk about a show or, um, you know, ask me questions about the work. So do that and whatever channel makes sense to you. Uh, and thank you for listening. Uh, we'll see you again soon.